the 40 years between that clinical research that you did in the 80s and then now, that, I mean, this is just kind of the getting on point for the, the clinical research pipeline, right? I mean, a phase one study, then you've got to do phase two, then you've got to do phase three, and then there's post-marketing. So it's not as though that ends at the 40 years. There's another... Oh, maybe five, another ten, decade, yeah, yeah, yeah before yeah, that go. gets through to market and proven to be safe and effective. Yeah, yeah, and, and probably one in ten of the studies that we do on novel medicines, uh, novel drugs, makes it through to market. Yeah, I mean, it's not the greatest of uh, success rates, but that's the nature of the game, isn't it? I mean, you need to have something that works, but is also tolerable, tolerable, and the ratio, oh, yeah. bluntly speaking, needs to be palatable. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And and pharmaceutical companies uh, cop a lot of flack uh, for unethical behavior. But I can tell you that in the early phase space, they are desperate to eliminate a drug that has significant side effects. So as soon as there's a side effect that was unpredicted or is not going to be tolerated, uh, that mm. development of that drug's killed, it stopped, dead. Yeah. So the kind of work that you're involved in now with New Zealand Clinical Research, it's phase one, early phase, that's a really large gate, shall we say, for a, you know, crossing between normal healthy volunteers or for phase one into phase two. Um, to, if you design a study well and you, you find out that it's not going to be commercially successful or it's not going to pass muster um, through the regulators, um, okay, Bennett, moving on to the next one. Yeah. Yeah, and you know that's something that big pharma companies can do easily because they have a number of molecules in their pipeline, maybe in the same class, maybe aiming at the same target that are just subtly different physicochemically. But if you're a little startup and you have one yeah. one drug in your portfolio and uh, you have uh, some toxicity, then your company's gone. Yeah, devastating, right? And often these those kind of companies have had you know. 20, 30 years worth of research that has got taken them to that point, a bit like this drug being an example, this new drug yeah, being yeah. an example. Um, so yeah, it must be devastating for someone who has really hung their hopes on. Or oh, yeah. mum and dad a mortgage their house to keep the startup going, yeah. Charles. Yeah, you know, so. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, which really speaks to the, the high risk, high reward nature of the whole industry, right? And that's why you have big, big players um, more so than you do small startups. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the Netflix series that has just come out, Big Vape. Um, it, it talks about the uh, the Juul, um, J-U-U-L, the, the um, early adopters of the vaporizer technology for nicotine and administration. And they um, tried to, their whole shtick was, let's pe take people away from cigarette smoking and put them onto vapes, essentially, and then people won't die because this is safer. And the te technology was developed more along the lines of a tech company as opposed to like a healthcare intervention. So it was just rapid pace, you know, success at all costs. If it doesn't work, doesn't matter, just, just ship it out, get it out to the consumer. Um, so that was quite you know, like a, a, an, an easy um, observation that healthcare is so much more complex than just creating a product. You know, we've got to do proper testing, otherwise the product is gonna be garbage, essentially. Yeah, um, there are some books published about the Jewel story where my name features because we did the pharmacokinetic testing for them in did, Christchurch. Did you really? Wow. And uh, so uh, I was, we got a minute to talk about this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. This is very uh, so I, I was working as an oncologist and I had a number of lung cancer patients. Yeah. Dying of lung cancer is a pretty yeah. unpleasant experience. Mm. And uh, almost all of it is associated, not all, but most of it associated with cis smoking combustible mm -hmm. cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Juul came along with this fantastic technology. It was around the time when there had been electronic cigarettes. Yeah. They were really crude and they used a different form of nicotine mm -hmm. and, and, and you couldn't get, you couldn't mimic the nicotine hit that you get from uh, inhaling a cigarette. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did the pharmacokinetic experiments and compared a Marlboro Red yeah. cigarette, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, the one that had the cowboy the, that yeah. Yeah. sits on the horse. And, and, and uh, so the participants in the study smoked a standard cigarette. Mm -hmm. we, we measured the nicotine level every 30 seconds over a five-minute period, something like that, mm -hmm. and, and then a dual device. Right. And for the first time ever, we were able to show that the PK, the pharmacokinetic profile yeah. of an e-cigarette 
could match mm. and, and match that of a combustible tobacco cigarette. And so suddenly, as an oncologist, I thought we have a tool that will allow people to stop smoking, yep. Yep. get their nicotine hit. Nicotine's far, far safer as a single drug mm-hmm. than when it's mixed up with all the other stuff that's yep. in, in cigarette smoke. And then... Um, that was the end of my involvement, but uh, Jewel then went on and, and flavoured it with mango flavour and creme brulee flavour and, uh, and had a marketing campaign that was really aggressive, not designed for children or teenagers, but seemed somehow or another to have yeah. appealed to that group, and uh, they got into a bit of trouble. Yeah, absolutely. It was such an interesting story because they came from such genuinely um, um, admirable um, justification or, or mission statement you know, yeah, yeah. Like to get people oh, yeah. away from and I said you know 300 million people prevent them from dying if you can move them off from combustible mm-hmm. cigarettes mm-hmm. up to a billion or something which is yeah, yeah. Um, very admirable but it got kind of diluted through the, the tech oh, I, think, I, I think once the marketing guys get into it and uh, <laughs> you know you have these aggressively profit driven companies yes. uh, um, they go off message pretty quickly mm. um, and uh, so we in New Zealand have probably saved lots of lives by smokers switching to vaping, but we've also had a relatively unregulated market where mm. we now have a generation of younger people who are addicted to nicotine mm. without any particular benefit whatsoever. Now, it's yeah. a whole lot safer than smoking, but they never needed to get started vaping. Yeah, definitely. It became a bit of like a social thing to do. You're out with some friends and someone's got the vape pen and yeah. away you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, you would never you start, have to you're not going to stop. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, not proud of it, but many, many years ago during lo- um, COVID, I got into the, the vaping and I was mowing the lawns at one point and I had to have my vape pen on me. And I thought, okay, this is, this is not right. No? <laughs> um, and just quit straight away. It was very, very, quite tough. But yeah, I mean, I wasn't a smoker. I might have had a couple diaries with with the friends you know and the teenage you know like going out I mean, when you're 18 19 but yeah when you just pick it up because it's the fashionable thing to do and then you're suddenly highly dependent on it not great no, yeah. no and so I, I asked myself you know what was that the right thing to do or if I'd been involved in the development of some of the opiates in in the states that have gone mm-hmm. on to mm-hmm. cause the opiate epidemic how do you feel about yeah. that as a scientist, as a clinical scientist? I, mean, I suppose the, the the science needs to be done. Mm. You know, we 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 needed good pain relief. We needed a tobacco substitute. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, we can't determine what the consequences of that are, and you certainly can't put the genie back in the bottle once it's out. No, oh, that's right. And you, you, I think you make a good point that once the marketing guys kind of get their hands on it and it does get kind of diluted a little bit, you know, mm. growth at all costs, capitalistic models, that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, and if there's not checks and balances in place, there can be unintended consequences. Yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, the opiate is a really strong example of that as well. And Jill, to lesser extent, but definitely in the same vein. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, the, the harm from vaping is significantly less than yeah. an opiate addiction, but um, I, yeah. we'll see how history yeah. looks back on that one. Yeah, definitely. And and this might, this might be getting into kind of murky waters, but I suppose the similar thing happened with the whole COVID vaccine situation. I mean, um, the, the pharmaceutical companies, at least from my perspective, did everything that they were required to do under the, the regulations that they had to abide by. Um, and then the messaging that was dashed out by governments or, you know, the media was a little bit disconnected from what was actually done in certain respects. And that's when it gets confusing. That's when it gets watered down. That's when it gets kind of complex and uncomfortable for a lot of people. Mm. Oh, it, it's certainly been complex and uncomfortable for a lot of people, but I'm not sure that you're saying we should never have developed a COVID vaccine. Oh, no, no, definitely not. Yeah, we definitely should have, I think. Um, but when, you know, when it, it was never studied in, in um, pregnant women, for example, and then you have un- different regulatory agencies, or sorry, different heads of state saying everyone should get it, including pregnant people, mm. you know, that that's when it gets a little bit... Yeah, I, I, I guess we've already said, uh, you know, we're, it will be interesting how history judges some of these things. I lived in Singapore during the SARS epidemic. Doctors oh, right. and nurses died in my hospital. Yeah. So when, when, when COVID came along uh, uh, and we knew nothing about it, the, the only response was, 
looking back, what is the experience when this class virus, this group of viruses, uh, it, it goes mm. goes feral? Mm. And uh, I have I have only admiration for the speed by which mm. governments and and pharmaceutical companies develop the vaccine. And so, how you apply it, I think, is your point. Yes. But uh, the speed and the outcome, and ultimately the safety of the vaccine, uh, I, I think, was was an amazing feat. <laughs>